Sure. Um, I'm very glad to introduce today's speaker, Joanne Graf. Uh, Joanne did her PhD at the University of Calgary. And uh, today she's still working there, but as an <laughs> assistant professor. Um, her work revolves mostly around the Gimsel medium, specifically the magnetic field in the Gimsel medium. And she's using the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey, as well as other observations, to try to make sense of that. Yes. Uh, about it. I am. I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you very much for coming. Um, so since I am at CETA, I thought I'd make it clear that it's an observationalist perspective of the magnetic field. Um, right. Okay, so I'll just give you a brief introduction as usual, just to put some context around why I'm studying the magnetic field and what, where we're at with that. And then I'll discuss some recent questions and projects that I've been working on, and then really briefly outline where we might be going with this in the future. Okay, so the idea that the Earth has a magnetic field has been known for thousands of years. At least a thousand. There's evidence that it might go back as far as 2,000 years to the Han Dynasty. And this is supposedly a mock-up of one of their compasses. And then the first scientific description of the Earth's magnetic field was done in 1600 by William Gilbert. So we have some sense about you know, some real sense. And even now, we don't really know everything there is to know about the Earth's magnetic field. There's still a lot of debate about that. By contrast, the galactic magnetic field was first proposed, okay, there would have been a magnetic field in 1949, with the first observations of it done in the early 50s. So it's very, very young. However, we do recognize that the magnetic field is an important part of the interstellar medium. The difference between cosmic rays, gas, and dust, and magnetic fields with magnetic fields is that they don't radiate, so we can't build a detector to directly measure them. Right? So then the question is, how? Well, on the Earth, we use magnetometers, and there's actually hundreds of these things all over the Earth measuring the magnetic field 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and there's only one magnetometer in the interstellar medium, and that was Voyager 1 that left in 2012, and it was launched in 1977. So 35 years to get one magnetometer into the interstellar medium. Okay, so not very practical. And it's kind of interesting. My mom actually just happened to send me this article from the Lethbridge Herald, where I grew up, in 1989, saying that Voyager 2 had reached the pinnacle of its exploration. So it just got into Neptune. Right? So this gives you some sense about the, you know, how long it takes to travel. And in case you're wondering why my mom kept a thing about Voyager, <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> it was me in the kite store. And anyway, OK. So here we have the diameter of the galaxy. It's about 100,000 light years. It's taken 35 years to go 15 light hours. So obviously, we can't be putting out lots of magnetometers to measure the intergalactic medium. So we use something else, which would be the fact that magnetic fields affect radiation even though they don't produce it. And so there's several ways that have been developed to look at magnetic fields, um, all of which we have here, but I don't have time to go into all of them, so I'll just focus on the top one, which is Faraday rotation, which is what I use to look at the galactic magnetic field. So GMF is galactic magnetic field. Faraday rotation, just to remind you in case you don't remember, Faraday rotation is what happens when you have a linearly polarized wave propagating through a region with a magnetic field and free electrons. And then that plane of polarization of the wave will rotate in a very specific way that's quite well understood. That's a function of the wavelength squared, the electron density, and the magnetic field dotted with the path length. And so this dot product is where we get a lot of the information. So the path is always defined from the source to the receiver. So with this dot product, what you're getting, what you're pulling out, is the line of sight magnetic field component. So that if you have a positive dot product, that means the magnetic field average line of sight is directed towards you. If you have a negative dot product, the rotation measure, the magnetic field is directed away from you. So just knowing the sign of the rotation measure, let alone its magnitude, can tell you something about the magnetic field orientation. Okay. So how do we use these probes? So if we have probes that are emitting linearly polarized light, so light is confined to a plane, chances are it'll be emitting light at multiple wavelengths, not just a single wavelength. 
in the same orientation because of the design of the, the probe. So I'm skipping ahead, but pulsars, for example, very strong magnetic field, very linearly polarized radiation coming from the pulsars, meaning multiple wavelengths, but all in the same orientation. Okay. As, the way, as these waves propagate through the free electrons and magnetic field, they'll rotate, and you end up with a spread of wavelengths, of polarization angles. So even though we don't know what the initial polarization angle necessarily was, we're more interested in the spread because what we get is a linear relationship between the wavelength, the observed wavelength, and the polarization angle of that wavelength. Okay, so that gives us the rotation measure, which again allows us to figure out what's going on with, going on with the magnetic field. So there's two types of emitters that we tend to use to probe the magnetic field, pulsars and extragalactic sources. Pulsars can be as much as 95% linearly polarized. Galaxies usually tends to be as much as maybe because it's synchrotron radiation at most 70%, typically a lot less than that, but in principle, they're linear, linearly polarized. And so we have pulsars shown in red and extragalactic sources. And the idea is you can look at similar lines of sight. And if you know something about the electron density, you can work backwards and figure out what the magnetic field could be. We can make an educated guess about what it could be to produce the differences that we see in rotation measures from the different sources. Right? So then the game becomes whoever gets the most number of accurate rotation measures wins, because then you can figure out what the magnetic field looks like. Okay? So it's sort of like creating a, an image out of individual pixels. The more pixels you have, the better you can tell what the image is. OK, so basically, I'm going to do a quick summary of what we think we know about the magnetic field. So the first part is that we, we typically talk about the magnetic field in terms of two components, a large scale field and a, large scale, and a small scale field, even though there's only one field. OK, so we just sort of break that up into a large and small field. Now, in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of discussion about what we mean by large and small scale fields. So people so sometimes don't like these terms. In fact, they preserve, prefer uniform and random. Others like mean and fluctuations. Others go as far as say the one that varies over large spatial scales and the other one. And if that's not enough, some people say the other two. OK, and I'll come back to that. So they've sort of break the small scale field up into two components. I'm just going to call it large scale and small scale. OK. Oops. So the magnetic field is typically concentrated in the disk, very much stronger than in the halo. The electron density and the magnetic field in the halo is one order of magnitude weaker than what's in the disk. Generally, the magnetic field is observed to follow the spiral arm, so large scale field, more or less. There's more discussion about that. Um, the local field is very clearly going, counter, or going clockwise as viewed from the North Galactic Pole. And then there's a reversal in the inner arm, next inner arm in the Sagittarius arm going counterclockwise. Okay? And so what we're doing here is we're trying to figure out what the magnetic field looks like now, which will allow us to figure out how the magnetic field was originally formed and how it's evolving. And one thing I want to really highlight is this region of magnetic shear, so these reversals. So what that means, just from Faraday's law, is of course you have a current, a current sheet perpendicular to the disk. But observationalists rarely talk about that. <laughs> I thought you guys might appreciate that. Anyway, anyway, it's, it's telling us something about what's going on in the interstellar medium in that regard as well. Okay, beyond this, there's very little agreement. So what I'm going to tell you from here forward is really what my view is. But of course, I think it's right. But anyway. There's at least one reversal. No, that's, there's not, there's not, I don't think there is agreement. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are, are people who still think there's many reversals. But there's at least, this one's definitely, people definitely agree that that one's there. I mean, you can't, you can't not think it's there. The question is, how many more reversals are there? So, <clears throat> yes, and if you have questions while I'm going, please ask. I'm quite good with that. Um, so the thing that I've been spending most of my career on so far is looking at the topology of the magnetic field in the disk. So I just want to really briefly go over that. The first project that I was involved in for my PhD was the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey, which is starting to be um, discussed in, uh, starting to be observed in late 1995, 1996 is when the first observations were being taken for this project. And I joined 
um, with Russ Taylor for my PhD in late 1996. And so he suggested I do something with the polarization data that was coming off of this thing because nobody had, was doing anything with that. And I said, so I went away and read a bunch of stuff and said, sure, I'll do magnetic field of the galaxy. And he said, OK. So with the date, so the, all the observations were taken with this telescope, which is in Penticton. So if you're ever out near Penticton, I strongly urge you to go and take a look at it. It's a really cool f facility. It's only about 20 minute drive outside of Penticton. Um, this, these telescopes, <clears throat> what they do, or what they had been doing up to that point was observing in four separate wave, wave bands to minimize chromatic aberration, so distortion, and then recombining the bands. And I naively asked, why don't we just keep the bands separate? And the folks from DREO said, I don't know. And so they went away and looked and checked, and sure enough, there was enough signal to noise in the individual bands that we could use them separately. And what that did, what that meant was that we could then calculate rotation measures for the se four separate bands. So you could plot the wavelength squared versus polarization angle, and you could get the slope or the rotation measure very easily without having to guess, which is what people had to do before when they had multiple bands that were really far separated. And as you can see here, so the green are what we would observe, and it's very easy to unwrap because the polarization angle is only defined between 0 and 180 degrees, and you can just unwrap it straightforward and get the rotation measure. So from that, I was able to calculate rotation measures for the area of the sky for, for the CGPS. This is CGPS phase one. The blue are previously observed extragalactic sources. The red are pulsars, red orange. Um, filled, let me just go here. So open circles are negative rotation measure. So again, the magnetic field is pointing away from you. Field circles are positive rotation measure, magnetic field on average pointing towards you. So you can see most of them are negative. You get this little bubble of positive and stuff like that. So this is with CGPS phase one, and this is what we have now. So quite a bit more, quite a bit higher density. Um, and you can see right in here, it's mostly strongly negative, and you can see as you come off of the disk, the size of the circles become smaller, the rotation measures are smaller. And as you come towards the outer galaxy, 180 degrees, they sort of become mixed between positive and negative. And down here, again, mixed between positive and negative, but much larger. Okay. So then the results, the main results that came from this data are as follows. First one is that there's no magnetic field reversal in the outer galaxy. There was some discussion about whether or not there was a magnetic field reversal or two even in the outer galaxy. And with the data that we have now that's available to us, there's no evidence for magnetic field reversal. If we look at the pulsars that are available in the outer galaxy and plot rotation measure versus dispersion measure, so basically distance, what you'd expect if there's no reversal, the, men, um, the rotation measure should become more and more negative as you go further and further away because you're integrating the, you know, the, the, the angle shift until you get to, out to the edge of the galaxy. If there was a reversal, you'd expect there to be negative, more negative, more negative, and then maybe less negative because there's a reversal that's adding a positive com component. And so some people previous to me had looked at these data and said, oh, look, be they become really negative with these pulsars, and then you come up to the you know, less negative extragalactic sources. But these sources here happen to reside near Cas A, which is a very strong magnetic field, very high electron density. And so they might be art we believe that they were artificially influencing the rotation measures for those very localized area. So what we have here is a situation where you just have this very nice curve, which also suggests that the magnetic field and the electron density de decrease as 1 over r as you go further away from the galactic center, which also makes sense. So everything's decaying nicely. So there's no need to add a reversal in there to explain the data. The next thing we looked at was um, looking at the pitch angle of magnetic field. So now there's no reversal in the outer galaxy. So everything's just become more and more negative. And we know that it's B dot DL. And so if the magnetic field is perpendicular to the line of sight, the rotation measure should be 0, right? B DL cos 90. So we looked at the rotation measures as a function of longitude, and we looked to see where they go to zero. And they go to zero almost at 180 degrees, which means the magnetic field in the outer galaxy has a very, very low pitch angle, basically circular. Right? So that's, that's kind of interesting. So there was some de debate on previous models whether or not the magnetic field was 
basically circular or whether it had a high pitch angle. And certainly from the CGPS data in the outer galaxy, the pitch angle is basically zero. Or as one of my theoretician friends like to say, please say low pitch angle because zero also doesn't make sense. So low pitch angle. And finally, the CGPS data, for using CGPS, CGPS data, this was the first time we had evidence that there was a correlation between the small scale field and the large scale field. So previously people, it was easier just to treat the small scale field as completely isotropic, so random in all directions and all places, and the CGPS offered an opportunity to see that, that in fact the small scale field was tied to the large scale field. Anyway, and just this is a slide that I stole from Andrew Fletcher, which after the CGPS, other people started looking at our own galaxy in different ways and in the other galaxies. And we saw, in fact, that, yeah, there was evidence in other galaxies as well to show that there was this difference. And in fact, it was Jaffe in 2008 that actually showed, suggested that beyond just having you know, a, t a tide component, that perhaps there was a small scale field that was ordered and tied to large scale field and then still had this random component. So we're still having a discussion about what exactly it means, but there seems to be some correlation between the small scale field and the large scale field. And of course, I think the, one of the biggest influences of the CGPS was this idea of using multiple simultaneous measurements of wavelengths to get rotation measures from a single dish as opposed to multiple dishes. And CGPS still has the highest source density of any rotation measure study in the disk. So after CGPS, I was then invited to participate in the Southern Galactic Plane Survey with the Australia Telescope Compact Array. They had lower signal to noise in their individual bands because they too did this thing to minimize the chromatic aberration by doing multiple observations, but still good enough to get rotation measures quite clearly from them. And so here we have <clears throat> in the SGPS, which is looking more towards the inner galaxy. So we have a lot more pulsars in this region, mostly positive, switching to negative, Maybe a little bit of positive, negative, positive. And there was one extra galactic source in that region. And then we filled it in. And so you can really see there's lots of positives that sort of switch mostly negative. And so what we did was we did some basic, very empir uh, empirical modeling, not physical modeling, okay? But to figure out what might be going on. And basically we saw that the magnetic field was for the most part going counterclockwise, going, sorry, clockwise except for this part here, blue, which is going clockwise here and here. Now, unlike the CGPS, the modeling that we did here suggests the magnetic field was actually significantly more, had a much larger pitch angle, perhaps as much as what the electron density models have, so around 11 degrees pitch, which, which counters the outer galaxy of close to zero. So that was another interesting find. And just to show you that it, the data, the model, so the model's in green, the data's in purple, the model fit quite well. So then we thought, well, maybe we can fill in these gaps. So we had the CGPS towards the outer galaxy, Southern Galactic Plane Survey towards the inner galaxy, and so we decided to fill these areas in. And Anne Mao, I don't know if you know who she is, but she was a grad student with Brian Gainsler, wanted to do some observations with the VLA up into the halo, so we combined our efforts and requested 96 hours of observing time from the VLA, which yeah. Question. Yeah. In the SGPS yep. How much were you able to do about working out the radio dependence of the magnetic field? Like so that's right. right. So the only way you can deal with the radial dependence is to have in situ measurements basically from pulsars. And so we used the pulsars that were available in that region to, to sort that out and then looked, compared that to the extragalactic sources which were outside the galaxy. And so what we do when we use extragalactic sources is we make the assumption that even if they're really, really far away, there's very little rotation that occurs between them and the edge of our galaxy. So we can just treat them like they're at the edge of our galaxy. So we compare the extragalactic sources to the pulsars inside the galaxy. Is that Answer your question. I guess the interesting come out of that. Or? Well, that's that's what the, the, the let me just go back here. So that's what we were doing here is just sort of looking at. Um, I think I have an, I have another slide in just a moment that will maybe help you. Help me explain to you. It's probably better. <laughs> um, so we got 96 hours of observing time, which was actually quite quite a coup because the VLA is oversubscribed by a factor of three. So we got our, the full amount of time that we asked for, and so we 
and use her time to observe these areas to complement the CGPS, and I use my time to look at the, the two areas to fill in the holes. And again, we use multiple bands simultaneous to get rotation measures, and this is quadrant one, so looking at the low longitudes before and after. Again, these are pulsars, so you can sort of see lots of big positive pulsars, and then switching to negative, lots of big Neg uh, big positive rotation measures here. We couldn't get very much in here because it was just it was depolarized. There was just there was there was too, we couldn't resolve it. We couldn't see very well through here. Then the outer galaxy. This is previously observed extragalactic sources. Very limited number of pulsars, and then after, so very small. So here's what I want to show you. So this is now we have now we're in a situation where we have I've just at, gone an average the rotation measures in the outer galaxies. So we have CGPS here, some VLA, SGPS to here, and more VLA. And then we have all the pulsars that are low latitude, so less than one kiloparsec, plus or minus. Okay, so op again, open circles are negative, positive. I mean, this isn't the best graph. That I have like a million graphs to show, that I could show you if you want to look afterwards. But basically, you have to have something in here to resolve what's happening inside and then this sort of gives you a boundary condition on the outside. And so we wanted to know exactly if we could build a, a cohesive model. And we tried various models with constant pitch angles, and we couldn't make a single constant pitch angle work. And so what we did instead was we, so we looked at, so again, we have this situation where we have, we know that there's a low pitch angle in the outer galaxy and a stronger pitch angle in the inner galaxy. So we thought, well, what if they're both right? What if the pitch angle is actually changing? So what we did was we split this into three distinct areas. And the key thing is that we model each area separately without the requirement that they match at the boundaries, okay? Just to see what would happen, okay? So that we didn't do anything a priori. We just wanted to see what we could see. And this is what we got. So again, what we found was a, the best fit was a low pitch angle in the inner outer galaxy, a stronger spiral field in the inner galaxy. And so this was the first time that we had evidence that the magnetic field in our own galaxy varies with, with radius, which really shouldn't have been that surprising because we see that in external galaxies. But everybody that had been trying to do modeling before of our own galaxy had tried to use a constant pitch angle, and clearly that wasn't appropriate. Okay, so for fun, one time when I was at another conference and didn't really understand what was going on, so I started playing with this instead. And so I removed the lines and started just sort of sketched over top and said, hey, that sort of looks like there could be a bar or something in the middle. And you know, maybe it's just that this magnetic field, this reverse region here is actually connected, that these are all connected. And so maybe there's only two magnetic field regions, not a whole bunch of multiple reversals and thing is disconnected, that they're, they're actually connected like this. So I know it's not very scientific, and it's, we're a long way from actually being able to show that, but basically, this is sort of the cohesive version of what I think is going on in the disk of our galaxy. So the point is that we have a smaller, out, smaller pitch angle in the outer galaxy, a stronger pitch in the inner galaxy, and the point is that many reversals are not necessary to make this work. Okay, and this is sort of where things are at right now in terms of what we think is going on in the, in, the, in the disk. I know not everybody agrees with me, but I really, you know, Occam's razor idea, the simplest mo model tends to be closest to correct. And some colleagues believe that magnetic field reverses with every arm, interarm region, and I think that's too complicated for what we need to explain what we see. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Whether or not, sorry, how, I mean, how, they, how they're formed? Yeah. <laughs> um, depends who you talk to. So I, there used to be this idea that the, they was just, it was just a primordial magnetic field and that uh, you know, when you had contraction and rotation, that was enough to, you know, that, that would be how it amplified the field. But the, the, the timelines didn't make sense. And so the thinking now is more that it's some sort of dynamo. They're not clear on the type of dynamo. 
Um, but it might have been, you know, for the seed for the dynamo, it might have been the primordial field. There's other ideas too, but that one seems to be the one that's rising to the top, is that, that you have the primordial field that was the seed for a, a dynamo to generate the field that we have. It's not long enough. Right, which is why some people like the idea of multiple reversals. Right. Because it, it makes sense for their idea that, yeah. So, so that, that, I guess that does lead to the question then. And suppose, so, that, so the, um, the number of reversals, I guess, would be roughly the order of the angular frequency times the A of the galaxy. Roughly, roughly. Sure. I think there's a two, there is a 2 pi in uh, so six, so, so at least be, six uh, times hoping. Uh, easily a hundred. Yeah, we don't, and so part part of the problem we so we don't. That leads yeah. To my question. Which okay. Is, um, if it were something that large, that large number of reversals, um, is would it be inconsistent? Would we be? Um, so. I think it would be, because if you had that many reversals, you wouldn't have the, the distinction that you can see any, I, I, is what I would expect, that things would average out too much. That would be, you know, and it's just the one, at least this reversal and this reversal seem very clear. And if we had 100, I think they would average out. And so you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't see anything. And certainly in external galaxies, and maybe that's what's happening in external galaxies, I don't know, but we don't see any reversals. Or maybe one, there's a couple of galaxies that you might see one, but we don't see hundreds of reversals or even dozens, even half a dozen. We don't see that in external galaxies. So it didn't, from that perspective, it doesn't make sense either that there be many, just because we don't see it in other galaxies. Well, yeah. But right, so yeah. Well, certainly, no. I mean, you can, you know, you could, you could put in a hundred reversals and make a model that would fit the data. That's like you know, the more parameters you add to any model, the better you can fit the data for all the little you know, perturbations that you'd see, but it just, it just seems crazy to me to, to make something that complicated. So, okay. All right, so that's the topology in the disk so far. Topology in the halo, I haven't spent that much time looking at the halo, but just to say that that isn't very well resolved either, that there's a lot of discussion. Some people think it's quadrupole symmetry, some people think it's some sort of dipolar symmetry, others are just, saying, well, maybe there's some symmetry in the north, but not in the south. Or, sorry, some in the south, not in the north. Like, it's not, not very well resolved. But I thought, well, perhaps we might be in a position to look at the disk halo transition. Because we have the CGPS data, um, I had this idea to do an observation just south of the northern latitude extension of the CGPS and complement mate, so that way we'd get a nice slice across the disk. So this became the master thesis of Brendan Cooper. And this was that area before, so there's a one pulsar, one previously observed extragalactic source, and then we filled it in nicely. So what we then did was take, took the whole, you know, the, uh, the southern latitude extension, the northern latitude extension, and the disk CGPS, and then we just binned it up, averaged, it up, averaged up the sources, and then looked to see what would happen. And this was a one degree bin, one, de one degree bin, one degree step, and two degree bend, three degree bend, just sort of smoothing it out. And when you do just a simple Gaussian fit, the base of that comes very close to zero degrees latitude. And what that means, what that suggests anyway, is that there's no warping in the disk at that, at that latitude, which I'll come back to in a moment, but that didn't make sense in what we see in H1. So H1 is spectral line, so the, the neutral hydrogen. So we, see, we can actually see the neutral hydrogen warping but this seems to suggest that the ionized hydrogen, so free electrons, and the magnetic field don't warp, which is a little odd. Then we added on some data from Ann Mao's observations, and what we see is this distinct offset between the north and the south in terms of the peak where it turns over. And so we think that's because of this region called Region A, identified first by Simon Normandin and Kronberg in 1980, 
which was then sort of revised by Niels right, in 2012. So you can sort of see that the very bottom of this area that we were looking at would be in this anomalous region of significantly more negative rotation measures. So that would make sense why things don't quite agree. We tried to do a little bit of modeling with this. So we were integrating from all the sources to the sun. We had three different regions just to see which way. So what we have here is a, as a clockwise magnetic field in the disk, which we already know, and then just let the model tell us which way things would best fit in the outer galaxy. And we found counterclockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south as the best fit. And you can sort of see that fits nicely, except for the separation, which would be due to region A. This is counter to what um, Hanadel have just published in 2014, based on Hanadel from 1999, where in the inner galaxy, in the halo, we had a counterclock, they say that we have a counterclockwise magnetic field in the north and a clockwise magnetic field in the south. But the question then is that just because it, we're looking towards the inner galaxy or is it significantly different for what we're doing or what's going on here? So I can't answer that because we have a very narrow region. Anyway, so coming back to the warp, I've had a few people ask me, how can we not have this warp happening? And so we did some modeling, very simple, chunky modeling. I won't go into the details, but basically, again, just a very simple model trying to see if we could reproduce the data with a warp in our either the electron density or the magnetic field. And basically, there wasn't a lot of difference between the different models that we had. In fact, so we had the, the no warp was the best fit, and the second best fit was, was the NE and B warping down, which doesn't agree at all with what we see with the neutral hydrogen where it warps up. But again, they're not very much different. So the question then is, how do we reconcile this? And I think one possibility, we sort of came to the conclusion that maybe one possibility is that as you get towards the outer ga galaxy, you're getting this sort of flaring happening where you get the H1 separating out from the, the free electrons, which are tied to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field's not warping. It's interacting with the charged particles, keeping the charged particles down, but the, but the neutrals are able to flare out. If you guys, as theoreticians, can, you know, Think about that and let me know if you think that might be a possibility. But we don't know. We don't, we're trying to reconcile this, and this was just one idea that we came up with. Okay. Then we want to look at how our galaxy compares to others. And so that became the master's project for another student of mine, Cameron Van Eck, and in conjunction with Anvar Shukarov and Andrew Fletcher from Newcastle. And what they, so all of us, mostly Cameron, <laughs> dug through the literature and dug and dug and dug and found 20 galaxies with enough information that we could do some sort of statistical analysis on how the magnetic field correlated with other components of the interstellar medium. And we noticed that the magnetic field pitch angle correlates strongly with star formation rate and the total gas density, which was kind of interesting. And we also found that pitch angle is possibly, maybe we could possibly use that to differentiate between different dynamo saturation modes. And so it seems that something that we should be looking more for in external galaxies is really observing the pitch angle, so making sure that we have good data on that. So that's sort of a, another thing that came out of that data, um, and that paper on that is in press, hopefully will be published in the next three days. <laughs> okay. So all of these things were done using point sources. Okay, but there's still a whole bunch of data from the CGPS that's an extended emission. So we actually have polarization from stuff between the point sources. And so I got to thinking, maybe we can use that to tell us something about the magnetic field locally. I mean, obviously we wouldn't be able to do much with it because we're, when you look at the extended emission, you're, you can only see out about two kiloparsecs, okay? So I propose this uh, um, as a MSC project for another student of mine, Anna Ordog, and we had a lot of resistance. A lot of people said, what are you doing? This is gonna be useless. But we looked anyway. And so now you get to see what we looked at, what we found. So again, this is just to look at local. And so just to set up some geometry, um, this is, so basically you have Sagittarius arm, Percy's arm. We can only see about two kiloparsecs out, so not very far. Okay, so we can basically see into the Percy's arm, see into the Sagittarius arm, and then a little ways down the local arm. Okay, so when we looked, the first place we looked was just down the local arm. So here is the point sources for that region, very large negative, a little bit of a bubble there, and lots of extended, you know, polarized emit, or sorry, total intensity emission, thermal emission. 
And then when we looked at polarized intensity, it seems sort of a mess, the rotation measures for every pixel, so we reduced it down to signal to noise of five. Right? So you can sort of, there's a little bit of polarized intensity, but I was surprised at the lack of polarized emission looking down our local arm. Right? And I got to thinking, well, in fact, since the magnetic field lines are this way and what we're looking at in polarized emission is synchrotron emission, that makes sense because there would be very little synchrotron emission directed towards us if it was aligned with the magnetic field lines. Right? Because synchrotron emission, the emission is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So that sort of made sense. So the next place we looked was right towards the outer galaxy, okay, where you're looking completely perpendicular to the, to the magnetic field lines. And so we would expect lots of synchrotron emission. So here we have the total intensity. Now, to be fair, I realized when I was putting this together, this is just with, this, with, the, with the synthesis telescope. I haven't, this image doesn't have the single dish data in it, so it's missing stuff. Okay. But here are the point sources, again, bouncing back and forth between um, positive and negative. And here's the polarized intensity, right? So quite a bit more polarized intensity. And we get rotation measures. You can actually get rotation measures from this extended emission. So what's happening here, just to be clear, is you have emission coming from within our galaxy, synchrotron polarized emission, right, from within our own galaxy that's also being rotated by our own galaxy. So you have the emission and the rotation happening in the same volume. So it's a little confusing. It's not like in, when we were dealing with point sources where we had polarized sources outside the galaxy that were being rotated by a, a different medium. Right? This is the emission and rotation happening in the same volume. Okay. This is still, you still only have these four bands. You we still have the four bands. No, no, no. We can, yeah, you can't, you can't do rotation measures synthesis with four bands. Yeah. No, no. And this, there's no, there hasn't been anything. Well, I've looked a little bit at, with the GMEMS data, which has multiple bands, but the, the, it's quite large area, so it's hard to, to get enough. We're, we're working on seeing if we can extract something like that, but I don't have any of that here. But anyway, you can sort of see this, you can sort of see there's a little bit of blue and sort of transitioning to red, so that makes sense as well, because the magnetic field is directed towards us. There's a component towards us, and then as it goes past, it's directed away from us. So you have positive rotation measures and negative rotation measures. And then, so that makes sense. So we're looking along, here's the magnetic field line, here's the synchrotron radiation, so we get lots of emission. So now we're looking at between 50 and 70 degrees, so very towards the inner galaxy. And we have these negative rotation measures and extragalactic sources and positive rotation measures. Again, total intensity emission, and here is the polarized intensity. And beautiful, I, I don't know if you can just, I was in love when I saw this, right? Just the, the blue, very clearly what we're seeing is magnetic field pointing towards us. So this might be a way for us to identify exactly where the reversal is. So we, basically, the, we know there's a reversal in the Sagittarius arm. We know that, or at least towards that direction. And basically people say it's about one kiloparsec away. Okay, but this suggests if we're only seeing two kiloparsecs out, we can identify, yeah, so here we, so again, so we're seeing emission coming from these, these spiral lines and we're actually seeing into this reversal. And so again, here's the outer galaxy, here's the inner galaxy, and we can sort of say, well, perhaps this is about where we have the break in looking at rotation measures coming from, like, from our local arm versus the next inner arm in. Okay, so, this is, you can see the positive, which is, that has to be from the reversed area, right? Because we have the magnetic field coming towards us. And then it's sort of not very much because we're again looking down the local arm. Okay. And so what that means is that, so if we estimate it to be at about 68 degrees longitude, and so we're assuming we can only see about, about two kiloparsecs, then that suggests that at, this, at zero degrees longitude, the reversal is only 200 parsecs away, so very, very close. So I think that's another interesting thing is that we're actually quite close to where this magnetic field reversal is, a lot closer than we'd previously thought, possibly. This is still a work in pro progress. My student is only one year into her master's, so hopefully by this time next year we'll have definitive answers. Okay, and just to conclude, so transition to the intergalactic medium. Obviously, we can't do that with the data that we have, so there's a couple of projects. Galfax is coming, which is just about done. And, of course, ASCAP, square kilometer away. Brian Gansler will be here in about 16 days. He's moving to Toronto. 
So, and this is one of, this is his big thing. And so this, that's sort of where the future is, to get more data, higher resolution data, which will allow us to look at the intergalactic medium. Yep. Um, well, so this, the idea is this is a, um, we'll have multiple, multiple bands, much higher resolution. And so the, the com combination of that will allow us to get more data and see further and get more point sources. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know that? Yeah. Well, so Galfax has, um, so Galfax was done with the Arecibo telescope. So it has a lot more frequency resolution, but it's, it's the angular resolution is not as good as the interferometer. Because it's only 300 meters, whereas our baseline is 660. So. And does everywhere that Galfax looked also overlap with ASCAP? Yeah, so everything in orange is, is ASCAP. So it's the whole thing, and then this is Galfax. So that's the full viewing area of Arecibo. I thought that Arecibo would be great for doing like, rotation measure synthesis because you're not resolving out the extended emission with, with it. Yes. With something like, you know, this DR synthesis task that you're not getting. No, it's just, yeah, we're just right. Um, yeah, so we're, the data, we're, it's just about, we're going to try to add that in. So what we've done with the um, synthesis telescope, we just completed a, a pilot project, if you will, to add in the Effelsberg telescope at multiple bands to the synthesis telescope. But it's just a single band. It's not multiple bands. Whereas Galifax will allow us to add single dish data at multiple bands, and hopefully we'll, we'll get some more clarity on if what we're seeing is real. OK, so just in summary, so the idea of these observations is to allow us to get some sense of what's happening so that we can provide constraints on magnetic field modeling, dynamo theory in particular. Things that I think we know are that the number of reversals, so I think there's only one reverse region. Um, the pitch angle does definitely varies with radius, and that's consistent with what we see in external galaxies. So I'm relatively confident in that. There doesn't appear to be a warp signature. Yes, we need to check that more because that's only at one longitude. Something with like Galfax and ASCAP will be able to look at multiple longitudes across the disk, especially where there's warping up and warping down, and see if we can understand that. And the small scale field is tied to the large scale field, which is definitely clear. Unanswered questions, how is this cross scale coupling happening? How does the small scale field actually tie to the large scale field? That's something that we know it's happening, but we don't know how. Um, the disk halo transition and the halo itself will be something to look at more and the transition to the intergalactic medium. We always talk about the magnetic field being contained within the galaxy, but how does that couple? I mean, it's sort of like the magnetosphere coupling to the solar wind. How does that happen? Right, so how does our magnetic field couple to the intergalactic medium or is it just self-contained? We need, that's something that's an interesting question to ask. How do you get that at, unless you high latitude pulsars? Um, okay. Well, so, so there's the idea is that if we can get you know, rotation measure synthesis to work, so the idea is that if we can look at things in multiple frequent, like huge multiple frequency bands, that we can do some sort of um, you know, depth analysis on that. But it's not clear to me exactly how that's going to work, but that's the idea. Any other questions? Go ahead. Has there been any rotation by the synthesis data you trust to start telling you about reversals in that? I'm sorry? Has there been any rotation by the synthesis data you would trust that would actually tell me anything useful about the galactic terminal structure? So I don't really know. Has there really been much way done in definitive RM synthesis? Well, I mean, so what you've been doing is, but that yours has been more modeling, right? Using, but, right? Please correct me. Yeah, so, but it's been more modeling. But I mean, you know, with the, with the VLA data, which is like the big data set that everybody talks about, with the NVSS catalog, so Taylor et al. 2009. Yeah, I mean, that was just two data points, so. Oh. So I think Has anybody done that? I don't know. Well, there's the genomes. Yeah, genomes. It's not really public. Yeah. They're trying. I'm not sure. Oh, you mean with, with the fan region, what, what uh, Mike Willieben did? Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, okay, okay. 
I mean, there's, there's, there's information there, right? I mean, obviously there's information there. The question is, can we un make sense of it in a way that makes sense? And they're trying, they're, they're trying right? They're, they're sort of identifying, you talk about the fan region and how they think that some parts of it are local and other parts are far away. Right. Yeah. Um, since I've never really given much thought to what's going on in the halo or the fan region, I, I don't know how, and, and far as rotation as synthesis goes, there's, there are a lot of problems with ARM synthesis, right? So. Yeah, I'm just wondering the flip side. The, the sort of believe in stuff is like the only, I think it's like the only stuff I've seen ever. Right. Well, that's because, the, I mean, so it wasn't until 2000, well, it wasn't until my PhD that people started looking, using multiple bands at the same time from the same instrument. So that's only since, you know, I graduated in 2002. So after that, they went to, you know, people started recognizing, oh, we can use more bands. And then GMIMS and GALFAX started using a whole bunch of bands. So the idea of RM synthesis is actually very young, right? So um, I expect there will be a lot of attempts and may maybe even some mistakes, but that, that's the necessary part, right, of learning. So. Um, there was a question that I had. Uh, you mentioned that the size of the pitch angle might tell something about the saturation mechanism. Oh, please don't ask me questions about that. <laughs> That's Yeah, well, that's been, that's something that people have talked about different, you know, is there one single dynamo? Is there different dynamos? You know, is, and that's part of the, that's part of what interested me in looking at the disc halo transition because some groups were thinking that the halo field was an extension of the disc field and other people were suggesting that there was a separate mechanism in the halo. And so if we could see what was happening at the transition, maybe we'd get some sense of, is there a separate entity or is it a continuous thing? And so could there be a different dynamo towards the center, maybe towards the, 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 the galactic center that you know, what's happening with the, with the black hole, that something somehow is generating you know, sort of like a magnetic field with the sun. I, and I'd actually had that thought before. If you look at the magnetic fields of the sun, it sort of comes out and then it spreads out and comes back in. And so you have a different magnetic field direction out. And if you, you know, you can sort of, see it spirals. It has a, a lot of similar features to what we have been able to figure out about the galactic magnetic field. And so there's some, there was some reason to think, oh, wow, maybe there's something happening that's similar to that, that the, the, the magnetic field, the large scale field we see is just the magnetic field of the galactic center. But the, apparently that was already tested and proven not true. So. Um, as far as whether or not there's a separate dynamo in the outer galaxy, inner galaxy, that has been tossed around, but I, I have no skills to assess whether or not that's valid. <laughs> so. Any other questions? If not, I'll go and get some good cooking. Okay. Um, Joanne will be here uh, today and all day tomorrow, yep. so feel free to catch her in D. For D. 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 Yep. Um, and talk to her. And we'll also be taking her out to dinner tonight. Uh, if you want to come on, just drop an email. And we're open for suggestions for the rest of the Thank you. Okay. Thanks.